Hello, McGill. Hey, John. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. How was the trip, all right? Pretty good, pretty no, good. No, no, yeah, I'll take no, thanks. I got it. Thank oh, you. Let's go. How's London? Still swinging? Oh, yeah. Like a pendulum, do. <laughs> Did you hear anything about the woman or the money? Well, that's why you're here. What about Laporte? Where is he? Oh, he's down here in the car. Come on. Oh. And this is Mr. McGill. Hello, Mr. McGill. Uh, how are you, Mr. Laporte? Fine. John told me a lot about you. You certainly made an impression on him. Oh, really? You know, I feel like I've seen you before. That's hardly likely. Shall we go? Yeah. Now, sir. Right. Is he quiet? Quiet as death. You're awake. I hope you slept well. We weren't sure if you liked tea or coffee, so I brought you both. Who are you? And where am I? I'm afraid I can't tell you anything. I only work here. Well, where's my suitcase? Where are my clothes? In the closet. How long have I been here? Where's Laporte? Laporte? Forget it. Please don't be hasty. I can kill you if you force me to. What's going on here? Oh, I know we've behaved unpleasantly, but we don't wish to cause you any injury. We simply have to preserve our security arrangements. After you. What happened to the deal you described in London? That's off, I'm afraid. But we have something better for you. Perhaps, McGill, on your usual assignments, for which you are paid, what? 300 a week, plus expenses. There's no need for 
security arrangements. But you're about to be offered something in the neighborhood of 50,000. 50,000 dollars? That's right. Are you interested? I'm fascinated. Now, who does the money come from? You or Colonel Davies? Ah, uh, if you recognized our Mr. Laporte. A little too late. Oh, that was fortunate for you. Now, put this down. Please. Assassinated. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, what other job pays fifty thousand dollars? Would you kill for money? No. We wouldn't ask you to. This really isn't a job as such. It's a. It's more of the nature of a service. Funeral service. <laughs> yes. uh, how good is your memory, Miguel? Oh, it's just about as good as it has to be. Can you remember, say, New Year's Eve, 1962? Yeah. What did you do? Done, John. <laughs> How well do you remember the last few summers? It's not worth that much. Well, what about 1958? Wasn't that a $50,000 summer? You were working for American intelligence then? I was. You were stationed in Central Africa, small country, called Aquala. Really moved around. That's the summer we particularly want you to remember. Her name was Marion. Don't be flippant. You did work with American intelligence. No need to deny it. And you were stationed in Iquala. It's a matter of record. Never. And the proof is you recognize me. I saw your photographs. Everybody has. You were president of Iguala before the revolution. Revolution? No, no, no. Conspiracy. And you should know. I repeat, $50,000. Look, fellas, what exactly am I supposed to know about 1958 and Iguala? Well, everything. John, you've just gone to a lot of trouble for nothing. Perhaps you need a few days to think it over. Will you show our guest into his room, please? Think about the money. Perhaps your memory will improve. It won't. Oh, we'll help you. I brought you some lunch. I thought it was evening. You were mistaken. When do they open the shutters around here? When there's something to see. Do they trust you with the key to this place? No. How many of them are there? I don't know. Quite a few. And some of them are watching us right now. They can't be. 
Sure they can. Come here. Look right there. They're just behind that wall watching us. Look right through there and, and smile, because they're just on the other side of the wall. Smile. Let go of me. I wonder what they would do if I got a hold of you like this. And said, if you don't let me out of here, I'm going to choke this girl. They'd let you do it. Well, let's find out. <coughs> I'm not important to them. Wait a minute. I'm leaving. Oh, you're going to have lunch with me. I'm not hungry. Well, there are two plates here, one for you, one for me. Yes. I'm supposed to. Do. Have a seat. Very well. Go ahead. Come on. Try a mushroom. Little steak. What's your name? What's the difference? Well, I just don't like to strangle strangers. Judy. Judy. Anybody ever tell you you were a gossip? Try to speak. Now that you're awake, I'll fetch the doctor. Mr. McGill. But don't worry, we'll soon have you on your feet again. All we need are the right drugs and a uh, little cooperation from you. You'll be out of here in no time. Thank you. And you do want to be out of here as soon as you can, don't you? Get out of here. Your cure requires a little information. <laughs> a little information about Iquala, Mr. McGill. About Iquala. Equala, 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 equala.
Time of transition in Equana. 1957 is a time of transition for Equana, the small Central African country which has been under British mandate since 1919. Equana may be tiny, but its immensely rich mineral deposits have given it great political importance. There are university buildings where many of the staff are representatives of the forward-looking white community headed by Equara's president, Colonel Davis. 1957 has been outstanding in the development of Equara's industry. In February, the mines at Quesigui began to be thoroughly exploited, opening up yet another seam of prosperity for this small but important country. Now, we see the celebrations to mark the opening of the first multiracial university at Mazikwe. There are members of the staff awaiting the arrival of Iquana's president, Colonel Davis. And a great moment for Dr. Joseph Guabe, the first chancellor of the university. And thus a new era in the life of this unique nation has been opened. An era of reform and progress for all the people. transition in Equana. 1957 is a time of transition for Equana, the small Central African country which has been under British mandate since 1919. There's an ever-increasing educated African population. Here are university buildings where many of the staff are representatives of the forward-looking white community headed by Equana's president. It's Kirk. a bit loud, isn't it? 1957 has been outstanding in the development Cut of Equana. Yes, we have to turn it up after each showing, otherwise, having seen it for 30 or so times, McGill might begin to lose interest. Would you report to Father, please? He wants to see you. Certainly. Oh, well, uh, take it up a notch, Bill. Time of transition in Equal a small Central African country which has been under British mandate since 1919. Well, maybe tiny, but its immensely rich mineral deposits have given it... <coughs> forget who I am, Major, or what I am. Sick or well, living or dead. Never, sir. What about McGill? Oh, he's on schedule, I would say. Any sign of a break? No. Perhaps we should wait. I think not. The fear is building up in him. What we've done so far must be taking effect. He's no weakling. And precisely why we must go ahead. If we don't, he'll adjust to the present pattern. I want another opinion. My results have always been satisfactory to you before, sir. Your results have always been based on my judgment. Stay here. Sir? But its immensely rich mineral deposits have given it great political importance. There's an ever-increasing educated African population. I didn't think I'd find you here. Yeah? I keep hoping he'll give you what you want. Is what we're doing absolutely necessary? Yes. But in the end, he still may not help us. He will. We're asking him to betray his country. No, only to tell the truth. But he's suffering. We suffered. We were imprisoned, humiliated, threatened, beaten and exiled. Do you remember? Or have those years at school away from me softened your recollections? No. Can you save your pity for yourself? It's only two days. It has changed. In what way? He's afraid. He tries to hide it, but I can tell. Has 
been outstanding in the development of equality. It's immensely which mineral deposits have given it great. Well, sir. All right, Major. You may proceed to the entertainment. Take your time, by all means, Mr. McGill. Eating is to be enjoyed. All of life is to be savoured. You know, most people live a life of despair, McGill. I remember, for example, when I was a boy in Iquala. The natives used to survive like relics of prehistory, like animals. Come along, bring a glass and join me here. So a few of us started a nation. Communications. Industry, education. We tried to lift them from the Bronze Age to the modern age in one generation. And we were making progress until radicals and fools illegally took over with Anglo-American help, of course. They drove us into exile, and what have they achieved? We call it democracy. Chaos. The jungle's moving back in. But with your help, we can get back and save Iquala. I've never been to Iquala. Really, haven't you? Lights, John. You recognize this gentleman, of course? Yes, Dr. Guabi. As uh, Chancellor of the University, you knew him in a very different capacity. I never knew him at all. No, I think you did. It was Guabi who sought Anglo-American help to get his so-called popular movement into power. And you were the agent with whom he arranged the deal. Here you are, arriving in Iquala. That could have been anywhere. Hmm? And this? That's a phony. That's just two pictures you pasted together. English and American intelligence conspired to overthrow our government. You were the instrument of that conspiracy. $50,000, McGill, for your signature on a document which tells the truth. <laughs> Transition in Iquana. 1957 is a time of transition for Iquana, the small Central African country which has been under British mandate since 1919. Iquana may be tight, but it's immensely rich mineral deposits. How long is it since they took the bed away? Oh, it's a few days now. Well, they've given him some blankets. What more does he want? Come on, McGill. Have a good sleep. You deserve it. Here are members of the staff awaiting the arrival of Iquala's president, Colonel Davis. 
and a great moment for Dr. Joseph Guabe, the first chancellor of the university. And thus a new era in the life of this unique nation has been opened, an era of reform and progress for all the people. But the important country. Now, we see the celebrations to mark the opening of the first multiracial university at Mazikwe. How is he? Now in the prime of life. Mind you, he's still got a long way to go. It's quite fascinating to see just how long it takes. It doesn't fascinate me. Oh, my interest in this question was aroused a long time ago. We were dealing with vicious terrorists. Plastic bombs on crowded buses, you remember. When we wanted information, we had to get results quickly. Like this? Oh, no, we used uh, simple electrical gadgets, everyday household articles, bottle, box of matches could do the trick. We didn't have sophisticated equipment then, but believe me, we got results. I'm sure you did. I was only obeying your father's orders. And now? Still obeying them, just as you are. We're not doing these things for amusement, but only to achieve something that we both believe in. Well, I'm sure that'll be a great comfort to McGill. I mean, give him a reassuring smile next time you bring him his tea. Tell him it's all for a good cause. I brought you some breakfast. Well, I don't need any breakfast. I need some sleep. At least have a cup of coffee. I don't want it. Just take it out of here. Get that stuff out of here. Go on. Get out of here. But please listen to me. Things are only going to get worse if you don't give them what they want. What difference does it make to you anyway? What do you mean, what difference? It'll help Colonel Davis get back to Aquala, and that's all that matters now. And it doesn't matter how many people he hurts getting back. The people want Colonel Davis. Oh. It's England and the United that's States who are... baloney. Don't you know that's all a lie? I just don't want to see you or anyone else suffer. And what are you doing here with these people? I appreciate what Colonel Davis has done for Equala. He hasn't done anything for Equala. He's only done it for Colonel Davis. That's all he cares about. That's not true. My father has given his... So he is your father. Okay! I'm gonna kill her if you don't... Why didn't you stop it? Well, it was a very hard decision to make. I didn't want to see Miss Davies suffer any unpleasantness, but I thought it was a situation we could exploit. How do you mean? Well, I knew there was no possibility that he would actually kill. Even you told him as much, Miss Davies. Afterwards? Well, I've watched this man. I've studied him. He's not the type who will kill in cold blood. I saw this as a chance to show him just how far we are prepared to go. I hope you'll accept my apology, Miss Davis. I think you did the right thing, Major. Thank you, sir. And now, if, if you'll excuse me. Carry on. You let him get away with it. I trust his judgment implicitly, and I want you to do the same. He wasn't exercising his judgment. He was enjoying the situation. I've watched him, I know. Everything's getting out of hand. The whole world's getting out of hand. The wrong people are in power. John's personal feelings don't come into it, nor to mine, nor to yours. The only thing that matters is we must achieve what we've been working for. I know that, That's but... the only way to think of it. We must prove to the world that we're right, no matter what it costs us. You know Dr. Guabe. You know he's a sincere man. That doesn't make him any the less dangerous. On the contrary. What about McGill? We mustn't consider McGill as a person. We must think only of the part he has to play in our plans. 
Is that the way you want me to think of you? By now, I hope you do. as sane as you or I. What could he possibly gain from keeping you here indefinitely? Mark my words. He'll only keep you here as long as he thinks you I might want to know use. about Davies. They'll keep you here forever, McGill. Take the easy way out, McGill. To live. That's the important July. thing. August. Some promises, McGill. Just empty promises. May, June, July. Colonel Davis isn't so August. bad. He's September. only fighting for what he believes in. What does he believe in, McGill? January, February, March. No one knows. He's insane, I tell you. Insane. 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 Think of the money, McGill. The money. The money. The money. What about the money? to shoot you, McGill. I'm going to shoot you, McGill. I'm going to shoot you, McGill. I'm going to shoot you, McGill. Shoot you, McGill. I'm going to 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 shoot you, McGill. Mr. McGill, I have here a prepared confession which we may sign and go free. 
which states that you took part in the Anglo-American plot to overthrow the legally Koala government in 1958. I'm not signing anything. Very well. Since you refuse to sign this confession, we must decide how to dispose of it. Major, are you in favor of releasing the guilt? No, sir. Mm -hmm. Has the accused anything to say on his own behalf? I've never been any Guala. Major, what are your recommendations? We would do best to confine Mr. McGill here indefinitely. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I can't agree with you. He's dangerous, uncooperative, and unrepentant. The verdict is death. 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 Officially, the colonel doesn't know I'm here. What are you going to do, John? Leave the door open? No, not quite. Sign the confession, McGill. Whether it's true or false, what's the difference? You'll still be alive. It's only a, it's only a piece of paper, after all. Yeah, you know, until it's circulated to every newspaper in the world. American intelligence virtually accused you of treason a long time ago. Accused of innocence. <laughs> it's not enough to be innocent. You have to seem to be innocent. I mean, what, what does a guilty man do in your position? If he signs a confession, well, that's the end of him. All hope is gone. But the innocent man, well, he can sign a false confession. Because if he saves his life, He'll never be without the hope that he can clear himself. So you're saying if I sign the confession, I'm innocent. If I don't sign, I'm guilty. Ah. If you don't sign, you're dead. Well, how long do I have to think about it? Oh, just about as long as it takes to walk down the corridor. McGill. Put him in this chair. I'm going to shoot you, McGill. Shoot you, McGill. Unless you sign that confession. Sign the confession, McGill. It's only a piece of paper after all. I'm going to shoot you. Shoot you. Shoot you. If you don't sign, you're dead. I'm going to shoot you, McGill. Whether it's true or false, what's the difference? You'll still be alive. Whether it's true or false, what's the difference? You'll still be alive. Sign the confession, McGill. You don't need me for that. You could afford that. 
Now, why don't you shoot, Davies? What do you really want? <laughs> Take him away. Mm, that's interesting. What? He's taking the paper knife. Good. Now it only remains to make an end of this business. Or rather, a beginning. They're being arranged? Yes, apart from removing the props, furniture, partitions. Mm -hmm. Are you certain McGill is ready? I'm quite certain. And you, sir? Yes. I'm ready. Careful with that. Carbons. John, what's happening? See for yourself. Rewinds. I wanted to see McGill. Where is he? The guard wouldn't let me see him. Bulbs. Why is everything being packed? John, where is my father? He's in the living room. Going on. Our work here is nearly finished. Has McGill signed the confession? He'll do what we want. Then you'll release him. You must go now. Your ticket to Geneva and your luggage are in your car. John will join you in a week or so. Where's McGill? Why can't I see him? You can't see McGill because those are my orders. I want to understand your orders. I want to do whatever you say. But I must have reasons. Iquala is going to have a civilized government again. That's reason enough for everything. Goodbye, Judy. When will I see you? Oh, I'll write to you. Now, go to Geneva. Forget McGill. Please, Judy. And remember me. Ah. Where are the documents? Policies, stocks, numbers of Swiss bank accounts, addresses of our friends. They're all in there. Yes, I see. It's an enormous responsibility. You can rely on me, sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, when you get to Geneva, would you give that to my daughter? Are the men nearly finished? Yes, sir, Vincent Chetros. Well, uh, goodbye, John. Goodbye, sir.
You just keep your hands flat on the Well, shoot. Why don't you shoot me, McGill? That's what you want, isn't it? That's what you want me to do. You want me to kill you so you'll be a martyr. And it'll prove that there was a conspiracy against you. Why, you crazy. I'm not crazy. Just a man ready to die for his country, as you were, McGill. Drop the gun, McGill. Uh, it's not all that heroic, I'm afraid. You see, the Colonel's a very sick man. Sick in body, sick in mind. Yeah, sick enough to believe that death at the hands of a former American agent could revive his cause. And near enough to death to be able to afford the gesture. Well, what are you going to get out of it, John? Oh, insurance, political funds. We've insured him quite heavily. Uh, you're really something. <laughs> well, I don't believe in lost causes. Somewhere in the, in the world, I'll find another equal. So if you don't kill him, I must. <laughs> Until the police get here. Is he all right? Yeah. I'll go get the police. What about you? I'll be okay. I'll be back. For sure. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> Gotta get my suitcase. 